Welcome, I'm Ben Spencer from Light Ray Creative Digital. Today, we're recreating the pattern example included in my Blender Notepack SDF Notebox. Now this is where things are really gonna start getting fun. Unlike the last couple of episodes where we've more or less just been visualizing data, in this episode, we'll use what we learned previously about SDFs and how we can create and modify them to create something much more practical. We'll also focus on how you can use SDF Notebox to compose patterns and the tools available to customize those patterns. Instead of starting with an empty scene like I usually do, I'm gonna begin with my lighting already set up. Initially, I was going to include how to set up the lighting to match the example in this tutorial, but when I first recorded the video, it was very long. I decided to remove that section from the video because it's really not the focus of the tutorial. Recreating the pattern material here is the focus. However, if anyone is interested in a separate tutorial to recreate the lighting here, let me know in the comments and I can make that happen. If you still have a default cube in your scene, keep it there because we'll use it to build our material. I don't happen to have one in my scene, so I'll add one quickly. To get the rounded corners in the example, I'll go into edit mode, select all, and subdivide with three cuts. We're adding this geometry here so that when we add a subdivision modifier, the cube doesn't collapse into a sphere and instead it just rounds the corners. So now that I've got this geometry, I'll go back into object mode and hit control three. I'm also going to right click and choose shade smooth. This will give us our rounded cube to build our material on. Because we use the default cube, it's also already going to be UV unwrapped, so we don't need to worry about that. I'll open a panel to the left and switch it to the shader editor. I'm then going to create a new material with a button at the top of the panel. I'm also going to switch my viewport over to the material preview so that I can see what I'm doing. And then in the material, we have a single principled BSDF node with our new material. I'm going to delete that for now, but we will bring it back later. The part of the material we need to create first before we can do anything else is the grid that we'll lay out our squares and triangles on. With SDF Nodebox, we have a single node we can use to create that grid. To get to it, I'll pull up my timeline here and switch it over to the asset browser. And then change over to the categories I created for this to get access to the repeat infinite, and I'll drag that out into my shader here. For the repeat infinite node to work, we need to provide a coordinate system that it can use. In previous videos, I used object coordinates for this. However, because we want this material to conform to the surface of our shape, we'll use UV coordinates today. If we preview what our grid here looks like on our cube, we're actually not gonna see much. This is because the spacing on the grid is relatively high for the scale we're working at. If we start pulling down the spacing, we'll begin to see the cells of our grid. Specifically in the example, I used a value of 0 0.175 for the X and Y, and then because UV coordinate space is a 2D coordinate space, it doesn't matter what you put in the Z axis as the Z axis doesn't exist in UV space. So I'm just gonna leave it at zero. I'll add a mapping node before the repeat infinite and set it to texture. This will allow us to rotate our grid and give us more control over its size. I'll set the rotation to 60 degrees on the Z axis and set the scale to 0.2 on all axes to match the example. Looking at our grid on the cube, we can see that each cell has its own coordinate system built in. So then when we plug the vector from the repeat infinite into an SDF node, a copy of that SDF will be created for each cell on the grid. To match our example, I'm gonna grab a copy of both the 2D box and 2D equilateral triangle from the asset browser, and I'll plug in our vector into both of these. If I preview either of these SDFs right now, you're not gonna see much because the size of the SDFs is too large relative to our grid. To fix this, I'm gonna set the size of our box to 0.35 and the scale to 0.1. I'll also do the same for our triangle, setting the radius to 0.4 with a scale of 0.1. And now as I switch between the two nodes, we can see both the square and the triangle in our grid. However, now we need a way to select which shape we want to display depending on which cell it's in. In the original example, I laid them out in an almost plaid pattern with two by two grids filled with squares and two by one grids of triangles between them. To make this selection, we need to create a mask. In this case, it'll be a texture where it's white where we want the cells to be triangles and black where we want the cells to be squares. And we can create this texture from the cell ID output of our repeat infinite node. I'll preview this on a plane so that we can view it better. The cell ID gives us coordinates of each, gives us the coordinate of each cell relative to the grid. So each cell will have an independent X and Y value. For example, the cell in the corner here is black because its location within the grid is zero, zero. And when you convert that to color, you just get black. As we move further to the right, the cells become more red. This is because the X coordinates of their ID is increasing, translating to red when converted to a color. 
The cell directly next to our black cell has an x value of 1, and the one next to it is 2, and so on and so on. The same happens to the y coordinate as you move further up the grid, translating to green when viewed as a color. To create our plaid pattern, it might not make sense at first, but trust, me, but trust me for now. I'll explain what I do as I go. I'll separate out the x, y, z of our cell id vector, and then plug the x value into a modulo node with a value of 3. The modulo node is very similar to the ping pong node we used in the last episode. The ping pong node will let your input increase to the threshold you specify and then reverse back down to 0. However, once you pass the threshold in the modulo node, it will instead restart from 0. If you preview the output of the modulo node, you can see this in the bands it creates. The first band will be black because, it's a, because it has a value of 0. The next band has a value of 1, and the one after that has a value of 2, but then when there should be a band with a value of 3, it restarts back to 0, then repeats going to 1, 2, and then back down to 0, and so on. However, we want to work with individual cells rather than with vertical columns like this, so we need to pull our y coordinate back into here somehow. And I'll do that by adding the x and the y together before they go into the modulo node. Looking at the output now, you'll see a checker pattern. So what's happening? It becomes more noticeable when I toggle the add node on and off. And you can, and you can see that the different rows sort of get pushed off to the left. If we look at this row by row, the first row still looks the same because all of the cells there still have a y value of zero. So they remain unchanged when we add that to the, with their x value. But if we look at the next row up, all of these cells have a value of one for their y value in their cell ID. So we're adding one to this, cell, to this row's cells. Starting from the left, this first cell, which would, have been, which would have had a value of zero is now one. And the next one, which would have been one is now two. The next one, which would have been two, would have been set to 3, however, because we're going through a modular node, it, get, it gets set back down to 0, and so on. And you can kind of see how this shifts everything over to the left. And the row above does the same thing, except that it adds 2 instead of 1. To get our plaid pattern, I'll duplicate our addition and modulo nodes, so we have another copy of them, but then I'll also change the add to a subtract. Similar to how our addition pushes each row to the left, this is, the subtraction will push each of our rows to the right instead. Hopefully that's more obvious if I toggle between the nodes. We'll combine these two patterns to create the plaid pattern we want. To do that, we'll multiply them together. And if I preview the output here, you can see that we have the pattern we are looking for with the 2x2 two two sections separated by 2x1 two sections. What's happening here is that the two textures we have, the values are, are, the values are either 0, 1, or 2. For the purposes of a mask, we don't care about anything with a value above 1, and we can treat anything larger than 1 as 1. Remember that anything multiplied by 0 becomes 0, and anything multiplied by 1 stays the same. So when we multiply these two nodes together, the cell, or any cell that is black in either node becomes black in the output. And the only white cells in the output are the cells that were white in both of the previous nodes. If you want to use a different pattern, you can play around with a threshold on the modulo nodes to get different patterns. Now that we have our mask, we can use that to select which SDFs we want to use in each cell. We can pull off the square SDF's output and create a mix node. We'll also need to plug the triangle SDF into the B socket, and then we'll plug the mask that we created into the factor. And if we preview the output of the mix node, you'll see that all of the squares that were black in our mask now contain the square SDF, and all the squares that were white now contain the triangle SDF. I like how the squares line up with the grid, but I want to add some random rotation to the triangles to add some more interest. To create this random rotation, we first need to generate a random value for each cell that we can then turn into a rotation value. And this can be done very easily with the white noise texture node. This node will generate a random value between 0 and 1 for each unique value we give it as an input. So now we need a unique value for each cell. But hold on, the cell ID from our repeat infinite node is exactly what we're looking for. A unique value for each cell. The cell ID is the perfect input for our white noise node. In this instance, the cell ID is a 2D value because we're in UV space. Remember that the Z axis doesn't exist in UV space, so I'll change the dimensions dropdown from 3D to 2D and plug the cell ID into the input vector for our white noise node. If we preview the value output of the white noise node, we now can see that we have a random value for each cell in our grid. However, we're not quite ready to use this as a rotation value. All of these values are between 0 and 1, so if we plug this into the rotation, we'll only get a random rotation within a specific range, about 16% of the full range of rotation that we want. 
Luckily, it's very easy to convert a 0 to 1 range to any other range we want, just by multiplying it by the largest number we want in that range. In this case, we need to multiply our random values by 2 pi, and you can get that just by multiplying, or just by typing 2 multiplied by pi into the value, because the rotation socket expects, a, expects radians when it's receiving a value from another node, and 2 pi is one full rotation in radians. Now we have a random rotation value, but we only want to rotate on the z-axis. So I'll pull out of the triangle's rotation socket and create a combine xyz node, and then I can plug our rotation value directly into the z rotation. And if I look at the output of the mix node now, you can see that the triangles are rotated in random directions. We now have our square and triangle SDFs placed where we want them, but now we need to turn them from simple gradients into something that looks like threads. To create those bands, I'll bring back our good friend, the ping pong node, and lower the value to 0.1. And the ping pong node gives us those bands that we want, but if we look, they're going all the way to the edge of the cells, which we don't want. We only want the bands to be contained within the shapes themselves. To achieve that, I'm going to insert an SDF to mask node before the ping pong node. By default, the SDF to mask node creates exact sharp masks, which won't work well here because the ping pong node needs a gradient to work off of. To reintroduce the gradient, specifically in the areas we want, I'm going to increase the feathering value on the mask node to 0.7. And as I do that, you can see that our banding returns. In the original example, I also added a value of 0.13 for the rounding, but that's optional as the feathering will already have some rounding built in. Still, for the tutorial's sake, I'll keep it in. Because we used a value of 0.1 for the ping pong node, the gradient goes from 0 up to 0.1 and then back down to 0. However, we want to keep working with gradients from 0 to 1 because they're easier to work with. So I'm going to add a multiply node at the end and multiply our gradients by 10 to bring it up to a 0 to 1 gradient. Before we go any further though, I'm just going to tell you that we're going to have an issue later when we turn this into a height map because this is a linear gradient. All of these bands are going to look very pointy and sharp and not at all like threads. To make this look more rounded, I'll pull out from the multiply node and create a float curve node. This node will allow us to use curves to define the profile of our shape. I'm going to add two points to our curve. The first will be just past the halfway point of the grid and about halfway up the top row. The next point is just before the, col the first column's end and about halfway up the bottom row. This changes our curve into an S-curve, making our threads look more rounded on the top and helping blend them back into the material on the bottom. This will help alleviate some of the artifacts we would get if there was a harsh transition instead. We now have the final mask we'll use for our shapes in our pattern. So we're ready to start adding color. Once we've added the color, we can start bringing this back into the principled BSDF. The first step is going to be assigning a color to each cell. To match the example, we want the square cells to be red and the triangle cells to be blue. We can do this really easily by reusing the plaid mask that we created earlier. All we need to do is plug our mask into the mix factor of a mix color node. Now, the black color in our mask will be the color of the A socket, and anywhere that is white will be the color of the B socket. To match the example exactly, I'll open up the A socket and switch to RGB. The red in the example has a value of 0 0.279 and 0 for the green and blue channels. Doing the same for the B socket, I want to leave the red channel at 0, set the green channel to 0 0.309, and the blue channel to 0.651. Now we need to mix this with our shape mask because we don't want the whole cell to be colored blue or red. We only want to color our shapes and we want the areas outside of our shape to be this third kind of green color. This is really easy to do with another mixed color node. So I'll duplicate the one we have here, plug the output from our original node into the B socket and input our shape mask into the factor socket. What's happening now is that anywhere that's white in our mask will become the color of the B socket which is attached to our first mix color node, which means that it will either be red or blue depending on its cell, and anywhere that's black in our mask will be the color in the A socket. To match the example, I'll go into the RGB tab again and set it to 0 0.086, 0 0.109, 0 0.049. Now that we've finalized our colors, we can bring this back into the base color of our principled BSDF. It still doesn't really look like cloth though, so I ended up increasing the roughness to 0.75. I also added some sheen. The sheen will help it look almost like velvet, like there are a lot of little hairs on it reflecting light in many different directions, which helps it look a lot more like fabric. Specifically, I set the weight to 0.262 and the roughness to 1. 
Looking at the material as it is now, it's looking a lot more like fabric, but it's still very flat. So we've reached the last section of the tutorial, which is creating the height map. We'll use the height map to work the weave pattern into the material, and this is what's really going to sell the material as fabric. To start, I'm going to return to the beginning of our node graph and branch off from our vector right before it goes into our repeat infinite node. Using the same vector like this ensures that everything stays aligned if we ever need to move the texture around or anything. I'm going to plug this vector into a wave texture node. If I preview this, it's creating all of these bands that are already starting to look a lot like the coarse fabric that we're trying to make. Specifically, the profile is already set to sign, meaning it already has the rounding we created earlier with the float curve already built in. The wave texture is perfect for what we need. Currently, the pattern is very large though, so I'm going to increase the scale up to 50, which will make the threads an appropriate size for the material. I also have a trick here to make this look even more like threading. I'm going to duplicate our wave texture and switch the band direction to diagonal. If I switch between the two nodes, you can see that the band direction switches slightly between them. Now I'll use an overlay blending node to mix them together. Be careful here though, because the order you plug in the textures does matter. You want to make sure that the diagonal texture plugs into the A and that the X texture plugs into B. Now if I increase the factor and preview this now, with how we've blended them together, they look a lot more like smaller threads that have been wound around each other to create a larger thread, which sells the thread look a lot more than just the bands individually, especially from a distance. Before we go any further, I'll tell you right now that this texture will be too strong when we try to use it in the displacement node. So before we do anything, I'll run it through a multiply node and multiply it by 0.3. This will make it 30% as strong as it was before. Our weave texture is now ready to be used as a height texture. To do that, we can create a displacement node, and we can plug our texture directly into the height socket. From there, we can plug the output of the displacement node into the displacement socket of the material out. However, now we can see that the effect is way too strong, so we need to adjust the settings on the displacement node. To start, I'm going to lower the mid-level to zero, because we want the threads to be sticking out of the material. And then I'll lower the scale way down to 0.01. .01. It's starting to look more like fabric now, but our shapes look like they've just been painted on, whereas we want them to look like they've been sewn on. So we need to work our shapes into the height map as well. The best way I found to do that in this instance is to create a math node, switch it to smooth maximum, and run our weave pattern and our shape mask through this before plugging it into the displacement node. What the smooth maximum is going to do is very similar to the maximum function, which is that for any given location, the node will look at both of the inputs and use whatever the larger value is. The difference is that the smooth maximum will also blend between the values a little bit, and how much it blends depends on the distance value here. In the example, I found a distance value of 3 worked very well, in that it kind of overlaid the weave pattern onto our shapes as well, making them look a lot more like thread rather than like plastic that's been ironed onto our material. If I switch over to the rendered view, the material itself is actually finished now, but it still looks very flat compared to the reference image. This is perfectly fine for something in the background that no one will look too closely at, but for a close-up shot like this, there's one more thing we can do to really make it pop and look 3D, and that's to turn on Adaptive Subdivision. Fair warning before we go any further. This will add a lot of geometry to our cube here. However, it is very easy to turn on Adaptive Subdivision. There are three things you need to do. First, you need to go to the Render tab and make sure that you're using Cycles. Unfortunately, this doesn't work in Eevee, at least not yet. You also want to change your feature set from supported to experimental. Nothing's happened yet. That's because all we've done is enable the options we actually want to get to. Next, we need to go down to the Material tab, and then under Settings, Surface, Displacement, we want to change it from Bump Only to Displacement Only. When we do that, you'll see that something starts happening to our cube. It looks all lumpy now. It's trying to work, but it doesn't have enough geometry yet. The height map we created is no longer just changing the surface normals to make it look like there's more detail than there actually is, it's actually displacing the surface to physically create that detail. The last thing we need to do is go to our modifiers tab. If you look at our subdivision modifier, you'll see that there's now there's a checkbox we can click to turn on adaptive subdivision. When we turn this on, what's going to happen is that now the modifier will dynamically decide how much it should subdivide our cube depending on how close the camera is to the cube. When we turn this on, it's going to look a little bit closer to what we want, but it's still lumpy. If you hit F12 and render, it's actually going to look like how we want. However, it doesn't in the viewport. This is due to the default dicing settings. These are what determine how much the modifier should subdivide our cube. By default, it has a dicing scale of 1.0 when rendering, creating one face for every pixel you render. But the default slicing scale for the viewport is set to 8.0, meaning that it will create one face for every 8 pixels. To see your cube with the correct dicing rate, you can just render it, or if you would prefer to see it in your viewport, you can go to your render settings, then to subdivision, where you can adjust the viewport dicing scale to 1. 
and now you've got the correct dicing scale in the viewport. Now our cube is looking much better. Unfortunately, that's the end of our tutorial for this week. But next week, we're covering the sign example. The sign is my favorite example. I have a lot of really cool things I can show in next week's episode about using SDFs with realistic models. Specifically, replacing parts of the modeling process with SDFs and doing so in a way that will both increase detail and reduce the poly count of your models. Make sure to come back next week if that's something you're interested in. If you're still here, thank you for sticking around to the end. And if you're interested in purchasing this pack, there are links in the description. I'll see you next time.